This is Bible Academy. Today we continue in the book of Revelation, chapter 16, verse 1. Now, before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins at the same time. We're allowing His Spirit to control us. We do that by giving ourselves over to Him. Let's pray. <clears throat> Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for all that you have provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts, our minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we spent the last six lessons preparing for the second half of the tribulation and its events. It is a time of the great tribulation, the great persecution, and the devastating bowl judgments. We will see the fall of Babylon and the final battle, Armageddon, leading to the second coming of Christ. We looked at Babylon through history, both past and future, along with its king of Babylon, the Antichrist and his connection to Satan. The beast Antichrist will be Satan's own God-man who will claim to be God as he rules the earth during those last three and a half years of the tribulation. With that information, we move on now back into the book of Revelation. Just to back up a few verses, in chapter 15, we saw the heavenly preparation for what is about to happen with the pouring out of the seven bowls of God's wrath. Now, keep in mind, the bowls clearly are God's wrath. This is judgment. This is, I would say, even more than punishment. This is a wiping out of millions, if not billions of people, and evil that's on the earth. The seven angels with the seven plagues were in place. The victorious saints were standing on something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. They sang the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, which praised the Lord God Almighty for his greatness and amazing deeds his righteousness, and his true ways. Everyone should fear the Lord and glorify his name. The king of the nations will be worshipped by all nations. This is the way it should be and will be. So let's go back and look at verse 5, 15, 5. After these things I looked, and the temple, the tent of the testimony, was opened in heaven. And the seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, dressed in clean, bright linen with golden sashes around their chest, symbolizing a priesthood. Then one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from God's glory and from his power, Thus no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues from the seven angels were completed. That's interesting because God doesn't want anybody in the temple until he's done, until he's done running these judgments through these angels. So by the time we come to chapter 16, again, the great tribulation is going on. Now, what I have on the board here on this chart is just the second half of the tribulation. And if this gets confusing, let me just point out here, and, and there's a reason for it to be a little confusing, but <clears throat> the year starts in the fall. So whenever the tribulation starts, I think it's going to start in the fall of some year in the future. So from fall to fall is a year. Now here, year four, we're halfway through year four at the mid-trib, right? We all understand that. And then... You end year four and the fall of when five begins. Okay? You end year four and the fall when year five will begin. So you got five to six is a year, six to seven is a year, and then you have seven to the end of that year seven to the fall, and that's when Christ returns. 
The major marker of the beginning of the second half of the tribulation was the setting up of the image of the beast in the temple in Jerusalem. It was demanded of everyone to worship the beast and take the mark. A remnant of Jews have escaped Jerusalem are, and are in a eastern, southeastern uh, of Jerusalem refuge. So they are on the other side of the Jordan, probably down on the east side of the Dead Sea area. The Antichrist, no doubt, is utterly frustrated, having lost the opportunity to wipe out that Jewish remnant. Saul begins the great persecution of all believers worldwide. <clears throat> Jesus said, If the Lord had not shortened those days, no life would have been saved. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is the slaughter would have continued, but I think even more so, these judgments are so devastating that the human race wouldn't survive. And they're going to be so devastating, it's going to be hard to even imagine trying to survive in that environment. So let's picture the world scene as we come to chapter 16. All right. The image of the beast is in the temple. The beast Antichrist claims to be God. The beast false prophet demands that everyone on earth worship him and take the mark of the beast. Christians are being imprisoned and executed. I have uh, watched a number of documentaries on the Jewish persecution by the Nazis. There's a lot of them out now, uh, people who were eyewitnesses, people who experienced it, who, people who lost their families in this, and they bring out film and pictures like you've never seen, and it's horrible. They don't have the worst stuff on there, but they talk about it. <clears throat> stuff that's so difficult to believe. Uh, it's a shock to your ears. I expect similar things will happen to believers. They'll take your property. They will take your family. And they will run you through torture, probably trying to find out where other believers are. Expose them, betray them, and some will. And then kill them. To understand the full impact of these bold judgments that are coming up, that's where we're going. <clears throat> Some key points should be understood. I start the bold judgments right here where I have it written, bold judgments. Now, I must tell you, we have to be flexible on these times, and I will show you why I think they have to be at the end. They may even come in the last six months. Okay. <clears throat> That's one reason I'm careful about putting any dates because I don't think we know the dates. We can only uh, guess, especially once it starts, then you'll have a good idea when these things are coming. But we don't even know when this all starts, first of all. And uh, we just don't have the details given in Scripture. And that's fine. We don't need that. We're always to be ready. Understand the first four bold judgments are worldwide. The fifth judgment is more specific and that it only goes on the kingdom of the beast and his capital. It's darkness. But we're going to talk about those first four bold judgments. These judgments are directed to affect all of mankind that follow the beast and take the mark. That's clear. It's for their punishment. It's for their judgment. They're going to suffer lack of water, lack of food, scorched by the sun, sores, open, miserable, a miserable situation. In the meantime, believers are exempt from those judgments, but they will be hotly pursued by the Antichrist and his army, his people. And their motivation will be, well, you need to worship this Antichrist. Not only is it demanded, but it's what's best. And besides, he's God. Uh, can you just imagine the level of propaganda uh, I expect nothing in the world has ever been seen like this, certainly not worldwide. And Christians are going to be arrested and thrown in jail uh, and killed. By now, the gospel has gone worldwide. We saw that a couple different ways. So everyone is without excuse. Now, 
I'm going to do a few things here that's a little different than what I usually do, but I have a purpose in this because uh, I would tell people some of these chapters you need to read before we even get there, but I'm going to go ahead and read what we're going to look at, at least uh, some of it today. I'm going to read through this so you'll have an idea what's coming and what we're about to study because there's just hardly any way to keep this in another order that would be more orderly that I know of. At any rate, let's just read through the first 14 verses of Revelation 16 that talks about the bowls. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the seven bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. Notice, wrath. This is wrath. It's judgment. Uh, if there's any repentance left, I expect there's not much time left or many people left to do it that are going to do it. All right, I think that's the environment we see here. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and a harmful and painful source came upon the people who had the mark of the beast who worshipped his image. So first bowl, painful source. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a corpse, and every living thing which is in the sea died. So, again, we have the sea, this time completely blood. All oceans, all seas turn blood. Third bowl, verse 4, Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of waters, and they became blood. So now you have your rivers and springs and lakes, their blood. So I think it's safe to say this is all surface water now is blood. Then I hear the angel of the waters saying, Righteous are you and the one who is and who was, O holy one, because you judge these things. So this is the angel of the waters. Notice that he's righteous in judging the water. And of course, the blood is a reminder of the blood of the saints they have shed. Notice the reason. Because you judge these things, verse 6, because they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. Does that mean they're going to drink it? I'm not so sure. I think it spoils for one thing. But anyway, verse 7, Then I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given power to scorch people with fire. So now on top of the sores, nothing to drink, they have scorched skin. We're not talking about just sunburns. We're talking about very serious burns. Verse 9, And the people were scorched with intense heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has the power and the authority over all these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. They're so miserable. They're gnawing their, uh, gnawing their tongues. That's a, a, a nervousness activity. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores. Uh, remember the sores were the first bowl. And they did not repent of their deeds. So it tells us that these sores go on. So these uh, judgments continue on. They don't start and stop like the trumpet judgments did. Verse 12, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. Now, folks, we're nearing Armageddon. Remember, we're in the sixth bowl. Listen to what it says next. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the entire earth, world rather, to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. That, of course, is Armageddon. Now, I wanted you to get a hold on these different bowls because of this next section, this next section I'm, I'm about to discuss. And that is the timing and duration of these bowl judgments. Like I said, they're not like the trumpet judgments, which were or are going to be like the plagues. They have a start and stop point. They didn't last that long. 
long enough to do the damage and for people to get the idea that God is unhappy with what they're doing. Verse 1. Back to verse 1. Now let's talk about the timing and duration. We just talked about six of the bowls. Seventh bowl basically opens up to the second advent, that type of thing. So what we have here. The first four bowl judgments are so massive and so destructive and permanent. Remember, the sores, the seas, the waters of blood, the sun scorches. If they didn't come towards the end of the tribulation, I don't see how anyone could survive the tribulation at all, even get to the end. So what I'm saying is they're so devastating they have to come towards the end. That's why I said they may be down to six months. Because remember, if you're out without water, technically you can only live about, what, three, three to five days without water at all. So these people are scraping and scrimping for whatever they can drink. Okay? I got more to say about this. Also, you have a call for the armies of the world to gather for the final battle in the area of Jerusalem with the sixth bold judgment. And you have to give that some time because they don't gather overnight, right? Uh, I expect most everyone will travel by land, depending on uh, a whole number of factors, how fast it takes them. But I would expect if they're coming from uh, the far end of China, it would take a few months to get there, especially if you're moving uh, modern day vehicles today and reason and you got to have resupply lines and that type of thing. So there must be time for the call to go out and get the armies on the move towards Israel. Normally this could take several months or longer. One does not move large numbers of troops and hardware long distances without established supply lines. In modern terms, this means the fueling and maintenance of vehicles over multiple types of terrain. Again, this call goes out with the sixth bowl. So if it's going to happen, if the war is going to happen right here towards the end, okay, let me get my pen up here. If Armageddon is going to happen about right here, you got to have time for all the troops to get there. All right, so you're going to back up maybe a few months. All right, and that's the sixth bowl. Also, <laughs> And there's so much to comprehend here. And I, I really want you to get a hold on this because I think you'll find it, uh, the study may be unusual if you haven't heard it this way before. But also with everyone in pain, I mean everyone except believers, because of festering sores and scorched skin, having trouble finding something to drink, it's difficult to say just how functional people will be not to mention how many are still alive. Oh, it gets worse. Then, listen to this, since the second bowl is the sea turning into blood, we've already seen the effect of a third of the sea turning into blood and that basically sunk the ships. The ships couldn't survive out there. What would that do to navies? They couldn't move especially when we get into the details of this description. Now, that may surprise you. I don't hear many people talk about that. This is why some will go to symbolism. I don't think that's a proper interpretation. I'll explain that too. So you have the ocean is blood, water is blood. So how are people going to cross the seas? Can they fly? I don't know, but you have a scorching sun going on as well. And this gathering is towards the end. Few nations have the capabilities to fly a huge amount of troops within a short time. I don't think that's even going to be feasible. Also keep in mind that these bowls are the real background of what is going on in those final months. So you have all these bowls going on. Okay, I'll chart this out a little bit as we go through them. Whether it be lack of water, the burning sun, and then there's darkness too. That's one of the bowls, but that's just upon the kingdom of the beast. All these things cannot come too early in the second half. So with water, food, and travel, and trade becoming so restricted, how could large troop movements even take place? There's all sorts of questions that come up here. Super tough. So you can just figure the people who are on the 
move to go towards Jerusalem are motivated with their lives at stake. If they don't defeat Christ, they're done for. And they know it. And they know it. Things will be going from bad to worse to even worse. Worse again and again and then Armageddon. That's basically the way these bulls are going to jump. It's going to be bad to worse to even worse, worse than that, and again, <laughs> and then Armageddon. For these reasons and others, I put them no earlier than the last year, perhaps, like I said, less than that. I repeat that. I repeat these things because I really think we need to have these in our mind, just on paper, not in a book or on a uh, some sort of uh, computer screen, but you need to hold these things in your mind. You don't know what's going to be available in the last days. You're trying to remember what happens next. So I want you to visualize in your mind these charts, perhaps, perhaps write up your own a few times. That's a good way to learn. Do it every now and then. Review it. See what's coming. Know what's expected. So you'll basically have a playbook in your hand of what's going to happen. Now, these bold judgments only end with the second coming of Christ. Also keep in mind, we are leading up to the final battle of Armageddon. What Jesus spoke, as recorded in Matthew 24, is especially applicable here. After the Antichrist leads the way in the great persecution of the second half of the tribulation, that's called the Great Tribulation, it will be especially challenging for believers around the world. There will be rumors and false claims of the Messiah's arrival, but they'll be false. Just imagine how motivated you'll be to see the Messiah if you're living in this time to relieve you of what's going on. Major significant signs, especially cosmic signs in the sky will occur. A few words from Jesus, Luke 21, 25, and 26 on the screen. And there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on the earth. Nations will be in distress, anxious over the roaring of the sea and the surging waves, people fainting from fear and from the expectation of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. You see, you can see the stuff on earth occurring, but once you see it out in the heavens, in space, and you see, man, this is not just the earth, but everything. And people will just lose themselves. They won't know. They can't get a handle on this. Then Christ will come in his glory, seen by all. But leading up to this time of Christ's returning, are these bold judgments. The bold judgments take any previous similar judgment and intensifies it. The seals greatly affect a quarter of the earth. The sixth trumpet killed a third of mankind. And now the bowls affect the whole earth. Many of the earlier judgments affected the people indirectly by falling on the cosmos, that's the, the sun of the moon, on the earth, the seas and waters. But people were directly struck in the fifth and sixth trumpets with demonic creatures. The bold judgments will be worldwide, spoiling basic provisions for the survival of mankind. Water, food, too much sun, then lack of sun on the beast's kingdoms, his kingdom. There is a movement from catastrophic judgments in the first four bowls to direct fifth bowl judgment on the throne and king of the beast, the kingdom of the beast. The preparation for the final battle in the sixth bowl and then the final destruction in the seventh bowl. We see the repeated themes of God's justice, his wrath, sometimes an opportunity for repentance, uh, that's pretty much over with, as I said. That's over with. His wrath and opportunity for, for repentance. 
but that's over with. Much of the population has taken the mark of the beast, having no intention of repentance. That's why they're dying off. They've made their decision. They're still a minority. Apparently, I think that's clear. You have to have a minority who didn't accept the mark of the beast, who were not believers. How they resisted, where they were. Well, we just know there's some who do turn towards Christ. Otherwise, who would who would the remaining saints testify to? And you do have repentance at the second coming. So it sounds like kind of a mixed message there. But basically, those who have committed to the beast are going to go the way of the beast, period. Uh, there's the Christians who are being uh, captured and killed. And then those few, who I would say, uh, won't take the mark of the beast. They're not going to have that kind of control over their lives, whatever they base that upon. Uh, or they're out so remote somewhere they never get the word or something like that. That's hard to imagine, but uh, it just depends. I can't make a blanket statement because I don't think the scripture does. Anyway, with that said, nothing is said of any chance of repentance. So these judgments are for punishment and showing clearly that nothing in nature surpasses its creator. And of course, after all this is over with, Christ returns, moves into the millennial kingdom, which is the harbinger of eternity. Well, as we naturally do, we are to picture these judgments in our imagination of what it'll be like. And if you're anything like me, I will uh, use my imagination trying to picture this because I want you to see uh, in your mind the extent of how devastating these are. I don't think a lot of Christians talk about this. It's probably because they don't know it. It's not discussed. I just, just know in my experience and reading over the years, prophetic material or hearing about it, I don't hear it to the extent that I think it's really described here. That doesn't mean it's not out there. It's just that I haven't done it personally. Well, in doing this, people normally make personal application in what they should do. But let me make this clear. To those believers who do not take the mark, the natural disasters will have minimal effect and the personal and personal affliction will not happen. What I'm saying is there may not be any water available as usual, but if God wants your life, he'll provide what you need. These are judgments towards those who worship the beast. His image, uh, take his, Im uh, his image, they worship his image, and take the mark. The believer's suffering will come from the beast, his world system, and his followers. And it's going to come to the surface like never before. That is the cosmos diabolicus. As we have seen in the history of Israel and his people, like the plagues, that's a good example those who obey God were exempt from the plagues. While the Egyptians in Egypt suffered, the Israelites in the land of Goshen, land of Goshen, did not suffer. Let's look at a couple of verses on that from Exodus 8, 21 and 22. If you do not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you and your officials, on your people, and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies. Even the ground will be covered with them. With this type of uh, intrusion into homes with the flies, it makes me think also you can't hide from the scorching of the sun or those sores or those demonic creatures. They're going to get to you. Now look at verse 22. But on that day, I will di deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there, so that you will know that I, the Lord God, am in, am in this land. What about the livestock? Let's look at an example on that. This is from Exodus 9.4. In Exodus 9.4, the plagues are said to be on the land of Egypt or the people of Egypt, Exodus 9.9, okay? Or their livestock, 
Exodus 9, 6. Even the darkness that could be felt. Exodus 10, 21. So the point is, they are directly affected. That is, the Egyptians, the disobedient, the Jews are not. Now let's talk about the, literal, the literalness of these plagues. How literal are they? And you're going to find that some scholars will back away from it being literal. And I can understand why they would do that. Don't Just because I say I understand it don't mean I would say it's right. Some scholars have differences of opinions on whether these plagues are literal or symbolic. Or maybe some literal and some symbolic. I interpret them as literal unless there's a clear reason not to. Now, there's no way to get around the fact that the Egyptian plagues were literal. And as we saw at the trumpets, some of these are not only like those plagues, but uh, they're worse, like the water turning to blood. Uh, let's just take a quick glance at the outline for a moment. We looked, this is under point E, I'm just going to look at these couple of points here. We don't want to forget our outline. The seven bold judgments, that's what we're under. Uh, the victory song, the heavenly preparation for the bold judgments, that's what we started out reading. And then we read part of the seven bowls of God's wrath poured out in 16, 1 through 21. So that's where we are on our outline. I'll try to remember to show you the whole thing as we continue on. Well, verse 1 brings us to the order to start pouring the bowl judgments. Now we start looking at the verse and picking it apart. The verses. Verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the seven bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. Don't miss these phrases. The wrath of God on the earth. This is God's purpose. First line, then I heard a loud voice from the temple. A voice again comes out from the temple, giving it divine authority and adding to the sacredness of this scene. There's no mediator here, so the voice is very likely that of God. It doesn't say another angel. Uh, I understand it as God commanding these angels. He's speaking. He's giving these orders saying to the seven angels. This is different than the individual calling forth of the horse and riders in the seals, or one trumpet blowing at a time. All seven angels with their bowls are commanded together, but they still take turns, one after the other, in their administration of the bowls. The time in between is not long, I think it's long enough for them to feel the effects. Um, it may be more like the timing of the uh, plagues in Egypt. They're one. It's uh, it stops when uh, people start, or the Pharaoh says, "I'll you know I'll do what you want." Then the next one starts, maybe just a few days later. So I think they're pretty compacted. I think they come pretty close one after the other. And they don't stop. This Remember, these don't stop. The source continue. There's no evidence that the source stopped like we saw earlier. All right, like with the locust, uh, demonic locust biting people, it stops after five months. There's no evidence of any of this stopping. So these people are miserable. People are terribly, terribly miserable. So here's the first command from God telling these angels, go and pour out. Pouring out is a technical term used during sacrificial rites. So it's something that's pictured as a, a uh, sacred duty. Exodus 29, 12, Leviticus 4, 7, and 18. It was also used for Christ's blood being poured out, the same terminology, Matthew 26, 28, Mark 14, 28. So it is, uh, 24, Mark 14, 24. So this is a sacred event at the same time. After all, God's perfect, holy justice and righteousness is being carried out on mankind. This is a perfectly fair judgment. Remember we saw how the uh, angels were dressed as priests in the introduction uh, reading. 
This is an act of worship. This is service to God. So they are serving God and pouring out these bowls. They pour out the seven bowls. Let's talk about the bowls for a moment. Interesting uh, description here. Fiale. This is a deep saucer. It's used in offerings, 5-8, cooking and serving liquids. So it's it's a bowl is what I would call. It's more like a bowl. And that's what it's called is a bowl. Of the wrath of God on the earth. The command is given for these seven judgments to begin. Indications are that one bowl is poured out one after the other, which are out without much time in between. In fact, the effects of the bowls continue on. This is the day of the Lord. Now, this is something I want you to understand. Let me write this up here. This starts that last uh, period of not only judgments, but I'm just going to say if it starts right here. The day of the Lord. This is what was often depicted in those Old Testament prophecies that talked about judgment and sometimes blessing. This is what they look forward to in the ultimate day of the Lord. The bold judgments are included in that. All the way to the Lord's return. And even technically it goes on into the millennium. We see that in Peter. But this is what starts it. This is the judgments. This is God's wrath being poured out on the earth. Now indications are that one bowl is poured, poured out one after the other without much time in between, as I said. In fact, the effects of the bowls continue on. This is the day of the Lord. So you have the bowl judgment started. As I said, they come late in the tribulation. I'm going to repeat some of this. Due to their immense destruction as part of the final blows of judgment before the Lord returns. Furthermore, the great persecution has has to get started and set in world worldwide. So what I'm saying is, over here, we have the great persecution going on. Okay. During this big period called the Great Tribulation. That has to get started, I think, and reaction has to occur, and the events have to go on for a while. So I see this as the first couple of years as being the Great Persecution before these bold judgments. So it fits. The world is kind of happy and going well there at the mid-trib until uh, the Antichrist gets upset with uh, the believers, remnant escaping. He kills off Moses and Elijah, and then they resurrect, so to speak, and they, they actually come back, okay, and they go up to heaven. And now he's really upset, and so there's a war on believers, okay? So understand, this is the war on saints, and they're spilling blood all over the place. All right? Now, when you get to the day of the Lord, that's the war on unbelievers. That is, those who take the mark of the beast and follow him. The bold judgments will go after the beast people. First bowl, terrible sores come upon the beast worshipers. Verse 2. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. This lays it out pretty clearly. It says the first angel, angel is implied here, that's why we insert it with italics. It's repeated throughout. Went and poured out his bowl on the earth. It is to be pictured as an offering to God. This is a holy righteous judgment the angel is carrying out god's will now let's talk about some of the description here and a harmful if 
the word for harmful, kakos, it's a word that basically means evil. It's pernicious. It is dangerous. It's horrible. It's terrible. All right? Not only that, but it's painful. The word for pain here. Paneros. Painful. Hurtful. Think of the worst possible, open, festering, painful, sore you can think of. This is at least that. The word for sores. Helkos. H-E-L-K-O-S. This language here is similar to other places sore show up in Scripture. Their descriptions. Let me give you some of them. Where dogs came and licked the sores in 1621. In the Old Testament, boils in one of the Egyptian plagues. Exodus 9.9. 9. Sores all over Job from satanic testing. Job used a piece of pottery to scrape himself. Do you remember that? Job 2.7. Here we have the divine discipline of the covenant curses in Deuteronomy 28.35. This is part of the covenant curses as well. Sores. Um, God's discipline sometimes comes in the form of sickness. So they are festering, they are running, and they do not heal. Now, is when my imagination comes into play. Open, festering sores are particularly messy and difficult to deal with. Taking constant attention, their leakage constantly has to be wiped up or dabbed, whatever you do, and continuous pain. Now remember, this is worldwide. Everyone has them. Everyone in the family, every, the, all the neighbors, Everybody at work, if you're even working, all right, I'm not talking to you now directly, believer. Little relief, little relief can come from whatever salve or medicine is available because they are said to bring pain and pernicious harm. This is punishment from God. This is a judgment. Besides, if there was some sort of medicine, it would run out quickly. Any serious type of human relief is unlikely. One should add all the additional troubles it takes for these type of uh, sores, the time it takes to treat them, the lack of movement because you're so uncomfortable, uh, not to mention the complaining, the crying, uh, caring for the young, the psychological effects, the resentment, uh, perhaps people fighting over trying to find some sort of relief. The list goes on. The next phrase, came upon the people. Now, the phrase here, you don't see this very often, but it's anthropos, man. Came on mankind, including male and female. That's one of the things we get out of that term. It's mankind, anthropos. This is like the sixth Egyptian plague where terrible boils came upon the animals and the people. Exodus 9, 9 through 11. This would make life very miserable for everyone who had them. So everyone on planet Earth is miserable. And we're still in the first bowl. But notice, who particularly has them? Upon the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Now, isn't that interesting? There they are, worshipping the beast, have that mark, and they see someone go by without the sores. No believers are affected. That's made clear here. This is a pattern throughout. There are those who have committed to the beast as his followers. In a sense, they believe in the beast and they worship him. And here's what they get. We are seeing the heights of evil and the effects and control it has on people's mind. All they want to do is kill believers and find relief. And uh, worship the beast. Those are the things they have in their life going on. Now it's a matter of survival. Um, 
I want you to just, you know, I, I like to take a moment here and let this sink in, how bad that's going to be. So while you're thinking about it, I'm going to put up here on our chart B1. Sounds like a bingo game, doesn't it? B1 source. Source. The second bowl, the sea becomes blood. This is, to me, one of the more fascinating ones. I don't think many people can grasp this one easy. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a corpse, and every living thing which is in the sea died. When we talk about sea, uh, you're talking about the oceans. You're talking about surface water uh, that's not in your streams and creeks and lakes. All right? The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea. So this will be in all the oceans and seas of the world, like the Pacific and Atlantic, and the seas like the Mediterranean Sea, the Black Sea, and so on. I don't see any reason to distinguish between the ocean and the seas here. They run into each other, as you know. They open up into each other. And it becomes blood like that of a corpse. Now, this is an interesting addition. And it became blood like that of a corpse, a dead man. Now, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen dead people in blood from them, but basically, we've probably all seen an old blood spot. Blood once exposed, if normal blood, that is not a bunch of chemicals in it like a undertaker might do, will coagulate. It starts to what they call congeal. It becomes solid, right? So a blood spot is kind of hard. There still may be some softness if you get the top off, but still, it starts to smell. It decays. Uh, the smell is a foul odor. So this is going on. It's not just blood. It's blood of a corpse. And every living thing which is in the sea died. Died. All sea creatures. Now the entire sea has turned into blood and all the living creatures in it are dead. No more fish or shrimp or anything you can't get out of the sea. That source of food, making a living, travel, is over with. The sea, the oceans are shut down. That's why I see this. For some interpreters, I think this is too much. They either avoid it or they say it's symbolic. I don't know how you get symbolism out of this, but anyway. Now, recall the second trumpet. Let me put those verses back up there because there's a point here I want you to see. The second trumpet, 8-8, eight, eight, and the second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. Now look at the results. And a third of the creatures living in the sea died same result we have here, and a third of the ships were destroyed. So I understand this, that all the ships of all the planet that's on these oceans are going to be destroyed. It's worldwide, and it doesn't end. Now, you can imagine everything and everyone dependent on the ocean will quickly die off. All those people who have 90% of their income or 90% of their livelihood or 90% of their food source, that's gone. I don't see how people on islands can survive very long. But you can imagine everything and everyone dependent on the ocean will quickly die off. The entire ocean industry is destroyed. Millions of fish and sea creatures dead in a sea of blood that is hardening. Ships of any kind destroyed in anything in contact or out in the water destroyed. That's the whole idea of this judgment. No more sea travel. People dependent on resupply over water will be gone. 
No shipping of fuel, food, or any goods. Growing numbers of dead and dying around the world. What is left of any of the economies is further devastated. Now, I, I think we need to just let it sink into our minds, and I'm doing a little coaching here, that this is to kill people off. This is to kill the beast worshippers off. They're dying looking at all this blood. And perhaps they reflect on the contribution they made towards killing the saints. But think of this for a moment. Fuel is rapidly running out. All shipping has stopped. Food resources, medicines, everyone is still sick from the source. How difficult it would be to function, to travel, to do anything. It goes back to at least the 1800s and earlier. You know, to travel from Jerusalem to Babylon was about 900 miles. I'm just giving you an illustration here. Taking approximately three months. Uh, Hamburg, Germany is 2,000 miles. China, some 5,000 miles. How long would it take for people to get over to Jerusalem for the final battle? See the problems we have to deal with here? So we're talking about several months of travel on foot, even over a year from the Far East. Maybe they're riding horses by then. Can the horses find food and water? It's hard to imagine how many horses are going to be still left. They may be back to horses and swords. I don't know. I've thought about that years ago. I says, wow, this sounds like it could be almost literal for that much destruction. What does this do to people trying to flee from Babylon when that time comes? How are they going to travel? Where are they going to go? Well, that largely depends when Babylon hits, but it's going to come uh, during these bold judgments. Well, it gets worse. Third bowl, fresh water becomes blood. Verse 4. Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and springs of waters, and they became blood. Let's begin to break this down a little bit. Then the third angel broke, uh, poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs. This is basically all your, it, the word is pege, by the way. It's springs and fountains, just where water comes up. And they became blood. Springs of water and they became blood. So, Picture in your mind, springs, rivers, creeks, filling up the lakes, ponds, water sources on the surface, they're all blood. This is similar to the third trumpet and the burning star falling on a third of the rivers and springs of water, making the fresh water bitter. We saw this. It was called uh, wormwood, many dying because of the waters becoming bitter. That was 8, 10 through 11. Now we have a more uh, complete judgment, a fuller judgment. Every river, spree, spring, and creek, all surface water turned to blood. Rivers and streams feed the lakes and ponds, which in turn would become blood and undrinkable. No fresh drinking water on the surface. An awesome reminder to the beast worshipers of the blood they spilt of the saints and the prophets. Now, with that said, and that's my view, let me give you an alternate view. Since it does not say all, it does not mean all waters. And since it does not give the effects, then we do not know how widespread it was. So I think that's probably reading into it. I think you had to put, uh, basically intensify what we've seen already. So I don't agree with that alternate view. Just giving you one. What we see here is the earth quickly becoming uninhabitable, not survivable. Where would anyone get water other than what is stored up or perhaps there's some rain? One possibility, let's look at the story here. Let me give you some background. This happened, of course, during the Egyptian plague. When the Nile River turned to blood in Egypt, it was undrinkable, obviously. 
That's Exodus 7, 21. You can't drink it. People started digging for water to drink. And they found water in the ground to survive. This only lasted seven days. I think that's when the plague ended. So there's water available, but you have to dig for it. So maybe well water is still there. You'd have to find something to drink. All right. That's a lot of water trying to store up for months. But you have to have some consistent source of water. I mean, how the armies that are going to go to Armageddon, they, they, how are they going to survive? And the only impression, the impression I get is that it's going to be very difficult. And there may not be near as many people gathered that at Armageddon that many of us may have first imagine. It may be in the thousands rather than the uh, hundreds of thousands or millions. I expect that to be the case. It'll be just thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps. So what I'm saying is you use your own imagination, put these pieces together here, and see what you come up with. And while you're thinking about that, I'm going to go ahead and fill in a little bit more of the uh, judgments here. So you have bowl two. I'm just going to put that right behind it and just say... Uh, the sea is blood, okay. The sea is blood. Uh, bowl three. Waters are blood. Okay. So this goes on and on. I suppose you can understand how some interpreters would want to say this is symbolic. This can't possibly be this bad. Well, I don't know. If I lived in Egypt and our water sources were gone, even if it was just for seven days, that would certainly have a major impact on my life. You drink all the wine and everything that's left until you can't find anything. Then you start leaving the land, whatever you got to do, and then it's over with. But here it's not over with. And remember, the blood in Egypt was actual blood in that plague. And don't forget, the purpose is judgment. Again, people are to be dying off, and that's what they're doing. Now, what are believers doing? Well, the ones are still on the earth. Perhaps the number is quickly lowering now because of all the persecution. They'd have to have a water source, and God can provide that. Think of the exodus in the desert. Moses striking the rock and water gushing out. God can do that. It's not a problem for him. The problem is us believing it. We have a tendency to want to panic a little bit if we suddenly see those crucial resources cut off. Well, any way you take this, without water, people die off pretty quickly. Well, we'll continue here next time. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your precious word and the challenge you've given us today. It really makes us think how important it is to stay faithful to you all the way to you. Come and get us, or we go to you. Challenges with the things we've heard today, in Jesus' name. Amen.